Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. You're not excited, are you? Welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Keeler. I write for the One Ring.net. And on behalf of the Cincinnati Comic Expo, it is my great privilege to introduce Mr. John Reese Davies and Mr. William Percher. Generous welcome, and I thank you all for that. Hello, everybody. Lovely to see you. I'd like to thank everybody that came and visited us today at our tables. Thanks for coming and saying hi. It's lovely to see you guys. And if you haven't been, it's still tomorrow. And it's lovely for all of us to have you here. I have Mr. Reese Davis. When this, when this was announced, this was a thing, this was going to happen, they were going to make The Lord of the Rings, this book, into these movies. Did you know what you were getting into? There was this little chap in New Zealand who'd done a few small films. <laughs> uh, I'd seen the mess that they tried to make of Lord of the Rings. Um, didn't the BBC or somebody tried to do it some, some years before and it, it just it never finished. The other thing is I've also been around some rather big productions and the one thing you know about big productions is the problems multiply geometrically. Anyone can shoot a film with you know four actors or six actors over the period of a month. Anyone can do it, and unfortunately, everyone does do it. <laughs> but when you're talking about 22 principal characters, and hundreds of extras, and hundreds of special effects, and lots of locations, it really gets, it, 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 it can get out of hand. I mean, I remember when we did Shogun in 1979, 80, or something like that, we, we lost, we lost uh, three weeks going over in, in, in Tokyo in, when, in, the, in the tanks. And they actually sent somebody out from, from Paramount with the authority to cut one hour out of the television series and, and just to get us back on track. So it, it, it's very easy to lose things. And the idea of 14 months of principal photography <laughs> in New Zealand you know, in, 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 which, you know, as we know, is, has nothing to do with filmmaking at all. With this little chap who's directed two or three rather good, small films, you know, I, there was no question in my mind that this was a disaster in the making. <laughs> but I, I, I was delighted by the prospect of going to New Zealand. What I wanted to do was find a nice small park go to New Zealand that I've never been, seen and, and, and spend a month or two there at somebody else's expense, get around, look around the country and then, and then come home and forget all about it. So I was horrified <laughs> when instead of getting that nice little park, they offered me Gimli. I mean, you spend 30 years as an actor trying to become recognized and you end up putting on a full prosthetic and becoming invisible for three years. <laughs> no, not for me, not for me. And uh, I, the, uh, you know, I, I basically said, no, this is a waste of time. This film will never get made. We'll get into the six months or something like that, and we'll be so far behind that, you know, the first one might get completed, the second one will go, and we'll, we'll be cancelled and spread. So, the only thing that got me there really was one my manager, my now manager, he was then my agent, said, John, if you don't accept this part, I don't think we can continue to represent you. <laughs> Ditch. <laughs> and um, 
And my elder son, who, who said, forgive me, Dad, I think you're not turning this down. And I said, why is that? He said, because if you think about it, in every bookshop in the reading world, no matter what city, country you go to, there are at least two foot of bookshelves filled with Tolkien's books, picking off the things. That means that there's a hell of a, a readership out there. And I thought, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, well, I said, fine, yes, I'll go. Uh, but there was duplicity in this art. I expected to go there, confirm my prejudice that, in fact, this was a complete waste of time. And, and then I would have gone to Peter Jackson and said, look, Peter, I'm terribly sorry. My family's in England. I've got, you know, some domestic problems there that I have to deal with. Uh, sorry, but you'll have to recast. And, you know, I'd get out there before we actually he started filming. It'd be all right to get a trip and all that sort of thing. Um, and I went out there and I spent the first two weeks going to every department there. And I'd spend the morning and the afternoon there. What I was looking for was just confirmation of my prejudice, you know, that there was a hope in hell. I mean, a film of this complexity can only be done in the great film capitals of the world. New York, perhaps, LA, London, Paris. That's just about it. That really is. It's too complicated to do it up. And damn me, in every department I went, I found a level of expertise and excellence that I would expect in any of the great film capitals of the world. And morning and afternoon, I would go in and I would walk out thinking, wow, these guys are really rather prepared. And by the end of two weeks, I had been to every department. And I really interrogated them, you know, and I was really worried because, you know, not only, not only were they good, but they were probably better than any of the great film capital departments in the world. But I still had a way out. And what does the man, what's the man like when he's directing? So I watched him direct a few scenes and here was a man absolutely, completely, completely in, in control of his cast, his crew. He could inspire them. He related to them. He listened to them. He had the answers to every question. And more than that, he could work with actors. And so having gone there as a complete skeptic, at the first press conference we had with a lot of local journalists in the South, I got up and said, gentlemen, you really have no idea what is happening here. I'm gonna make three predictions. One, this film is going to be bigger than Star Wars. The new Star Wars was just being shot. I saw Peter Jackson going. <laughs> <laughs> Two, these films are going to be amongst the greatest and most successful films of this first decade of the 20th century. And three, in 20 years' time, when you look back on the great films of your lifetime, Lord of the Rings is going to be there. Revise your expectations upwards. And of course, I got, I got pilloried in the local newspapers. <laughs> Actor says, Lord of the Rings is going to be bigger than Star Wars. <laughs> what an idiot, you know. <laughs> Eighteen months later, Peter Jackson came to me and he said, um, you remember that first, um, uh, you know, that first press conference when you said we would be bigger than Star Wars? I said, you mean that moment when you buried your head in, the hand, in your hands? And he said, yes, that moment. <laughs> and he said, I just want you to know that today our receipts have outgrossed Star Wars. <laughs> Peter Jackson is one of the great filmmakers of all time. Not only because he's a great director and, he, and he's, 
he, he, he is a great maker of great films, but because he actually created an entire film industry in New Zealand from scratch. And I don't know of any filmmaker who ever really did that on the scale and at the level of success that Peter has done. The other thing is, New Zealand itself is just a magical country. It's separated from Gondwana land before the evolution of mammals. So when the Māori got there in the 1400s, there were only two mammals there, two species of bat. The vegetation is different. And the vegetation, because we haven't seen many films from New Zealand, or haven't until then, that sort of sets the background and the flora for Lord of the Rings. It's a magical country and a magical people, and what an extraordinary experience. Smartest thing I ever did was listen to my son and my manager. <laughs> Situation. There is this phenomenally successful trilogy proceeding, and now they're assembling the new team. And you, I mean, there must, was there doubt, will it live up to the Lord of the Rings? The Hobbit has a different tone, what are we going to do? Were you, were you dubious? <laughs> I was the most excited guy on earth when I got that call. But firstly, I've got to say something. For me, what an incredible privilege to join somebody on the stage who I, it's like acting royalty for me, <laughs> Mr. John Reese Davies. <laughs> I'm up here on the stage with him and it's a very, very exciting thing. I told you I can only afford five pounds. <laughs> oh sorry, that's just You're, you're into 50 already. <laughs> uh, look, it was very exciting when Peter Jackson decided to direct this film. And I was at a party after I got the ride. I got the call. The call was just amazing. My head was floating for three days. Oh my God, I'm going to be one of the jewels of the Hobbit. I did two things. I went down to the library and read The Hobbit very quickly. <laughs> Desperately trying not to tell the librarian that I was in it. <laughs> the other thing I got is I got out Lord of the Rings. Well, I already had it in the shelf. And I watched Mr. John Reese Davies playing Gimli. Because I... <laughs> he goes, I've never mentioned this to John because we... Not great friends, are we, John? Uh, but we're dwarves. But we're not enemies. We just don't know each other. But I watched his work. <laughs> There's two things that probably John doesn't even think about that I noticed from Lord of the Rings that I put in and took to The Hobbit. One is, when John was playing Gimli, I noticed that he didn't raise his head a lot to talk to people taller than him. He used his eyes. And I thought that was a fascinating, I don't know whether that was a conscious decision, John, but I actually did really take that into the role. Because dwarves don't think they're short. Tolkien, us dwarves, we're not short. We think we're normal and everybody else is abnormal. And by, by doing that, the simple thing of raising your head, it's weakening you. And so John playing that role of looking up at people but keeping his head straight, it's probably the prosthetics. Um, <laughs> that was really handy, so I appreciate that and say thank you, because I did take that in. Um, but look, oh, this is the story I wanted to tell. I was at a party. I was at a party. I was sat down with Peter Jackson, and it suddenly occurred to me that his decision to make the film, because there was some cynicism from the media, there always is in New Zealand, about Peter Jackson doing The Hobbit. Oh, it's about the money. Blah, blah. Well, it's not. It's actually five, six, seven years out of that man's life. And for that man to decide to do The Hobbit and say, all right, you only have so many chunks of five or six years in your life to create things. So for him to actually take that on showed me just how uh, impassioned he was and creative at uh, um, making such a huge decision that he was going to devote that much of his life to making this project. Nobody does that like that. They don't do it for the money. He didn't need the money. He did it because he is an artist and he's a fantastic director to work for and it's completely normal. <laughs> He's, he, he, uh, one of the reasons why you knew that this was going to be successful was Peter is a fan. You know, he has lived and dreamt and read of Lord of the Rings all his life. And so he's, he is you. 
you know, he wants to see what you want to see. You know, the best possible representation. Okay? And, and that he was the victim of the tall poppy syndrome. This is a, a phrase we have in New Zealand. Um, when somebody gets, you know, too big, too powerful, uh, apparently does overly well, then the other poppies decide that he should be cut down a bit. It's called, called the tall poppy syndrome. But um, Jackson is a giant. Um, in fact, I think I based him on him. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I think he's the most. I look, Buffer, my character Buffer, is the dwarf that looks most like King of James. <laughs> <laughs> he's got grey in his beard. We have such a packed room. I want to open it up to your questions. Um, please do feel free to start lining up at the mic. Um, while you do that, though, I would love to ask both of you, Mr. Kircher, you're still kind of in the midst of it with the new, with the new movie still coming I am, out. I am. I'm still riding the dream. Favorite, favorite moments? If you're in shooting in or the next in movie. scene? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I can't mention them. There's a sniper in the room sent oh. by Warner Brothers. <laughs> They follow me everywhere. Favorite moments from the past, then, how about the past shooting? How... Oh, look, everybody knows about the barrel scene, but we just love that. <laughs> Getting into cool, cool water when you're hot, hot, hot. And we were very lucky. Our, uh, uh, the prosthetics in John's day were far less sophisticated than they are now. So we were very, very lucky. Our prosth Even though we moaned, I often think back how hard it must have been for you, because ours were very, very soft. Well, when I came down and saw you guys on the set, I walked in and I thought, God, the cheats! <laughs> they haven't done any makeup on it. It's a little blob on the nose and a little... That's and, just, and that's it. I mean, just extraordinary. It was eight hours a day of misery in my time. Burr, the youngsters, young dwarfs today, don't they? <laughs> younger dwarves had very little makeup. So we have this theory that dwarves get to about 150 years old and all of a sudden their noses go <laughs> and their ears go and their beards go <laughs> there, there was quite an enormous lot of chatter about that on the boards at the One Ring when the cast was announced we all kind of looked and said those guys are all really hot. They're playing the dwarves. Wait, 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 wait. So, and it was kind of a mix well, you, of the prosthetics. You, you know really what happened was the, uh, the powers of the in Warner Brothers said, you know, oh yes, we're going to make this great trilogy, we're going to make three films out of it, you know, and this sort of thing. And then somebody pointed out it's about dwarves, and they went, what do you mean? <laughs> you, 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 you don't mean, you know, dwarf dwarves, you mean? I mean you know, there's probably a dwarf or two in it, but it's really about, you know, um, Viggo Mortensen type figure and, you know, and all that sort of thing. No, no, it's actually about a hobbit and dwarves. What do you mean? You mean they have to look like John Reese did? We can't do this! Please stop, he's so right. Samus says, we gotta make some of these guys look hot. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Ask a question, sir. So this, uh, this one should apply to uh, both here, I think. Um, so I've read that originally they wanted uh, Sean Connery for Gandalf, and he turned down because he didn't get it, and he would have been the highest paid actor ever if he had. Um, I'm just curious how you guys think it would have gone though differently if you guys were working with uh, Sean Connery instead of Ian McKellen as, uh, as the Gandalf role. <laughs> I can't imagine anybody else in it. Having worked with Ian and the fact that I, he, you know, saw all the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but he, he was so magnificent, so magnificent at Gandalf that you can't, I could not put my head into anything else, personally. Just couldn't imagine. Run, you fools! <laughs> I, I, I somehow don't think that Sean could have taken it that seriously, to be honest. But for instance, um, those of you who are old enough to remember Shogun, 
uh, the Richard Chamberlain part was written for and not for two short uh, in that, but he turned it down because he didn't like, he, 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 he didn't want to do television. He was a film star. And, and James Cordell lamented that considerably, but I think he changed his mind when he saw how well Richard played it. You never know. We get these things tense hand sometimes. Yes. Well, you just mentioned Shogun, but uh, you played a second uh, James Cordell character. Uh, so I wonder if you can contrast uh, Rodriguez to Colin Port. Quill and Gaunt, yes. Yes, a first-class shit. <laughs> but very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, first, uh, what advice would you give to an aspiring actor, and what is it like knowing that you've been a part of the series that will be remembered for generations? Uh, for an aspiring actor, just keep doing it. That's the best thing. Do plays. Be in place. That's the way we all start. Just getting in front of people, making stuff up, being short films. Just keep doing it. What was the other question? Um, what is it like knowing that you've been been a part of a series that will be remembered for generations? Well, hopefully, The Hobbit will be remembered as much as Lord of the Rings for its artistic integrity. But to go down in history as one of the dwarves in The Hobbit is an incredible thing. And uh, we all feel that, all the dwarves, we all sort of, and when we get together, it's so fun because we have a, you know, it's a brotherhood. And so, you know, uh, it's just an amazing thing. Right from the moment of that phone call, you know, I thought, this is a life-changing thing. It just is for everybody. It was for Martin, it was for all of us, a life-changing experience. That's pretty darn amazing and it doesn't happen every day. What was just that initial reaction, seeing all the admiring fans that showed up to see it, and just what was it like just being in that atmosphere with so many people just really loving what you've done or wanting to see what you've done? The, the enthusiasm of the fans was apparent even before we actually got to a premiere. Um, I'd, I'd sort of had a little bit of experience with this because I'd done something, you know, Bridges of the Lost Art in India. You know that there is enthusiasm, but the real scale of the international acclaim and, um, and support that we had from the fans was amazing. And uh, it, it, as you say, life changing, really. Quite wonderful. Quite wonderful. In Wellington for the premiere of The Hobbit. And you have not ever, nobody, you know, to get to experience this, a hundred thousand people cheering for you with pride and with love. And that huge outpouring of emotion, it was incredible. And they had the longest red carpet you've ever seen in your life. It went for blocks and blocks, and we walked every inch of it. And then suddenly from being just a normal actor, just as we all are, to have people around the world, because also we went to London Premier Tag, people calling out your name. And, uh, Mr. Kircher, Mr. Kircher! In the middle, you know, in places you've never been before, because once again in London there was like 20,000 people lining the streets calling out your name. That is incredible. And John has experienced it before. I've never experienced anything like it. And, and you will be very lucky if you manage to experience anything on that scale again. That's, that's exactly right. Um, because it does no, not and I, don't, I don't mean that in any malicious sense. No, it's it's just that it is such an extraordinary yes. thing. Yes. And most, many, or even most great actors never get that scale of, of, of experience. These are exceptional moments in the history of film. And, 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 and we're both very pleased, very grateful, and very lucky to have been part of Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to know, what was you guys' favorite part of seeing the Battle of Five Armies? Um, as I said, there is a sniper in the back of the theater. And if I mention anything about the Battle of Five, 
they would take me out. We have a very, very, very strongly worded contract that says we are not, especially at convention, not allowed to say anything. And before the films came out, we got an email directly from Warner saying, we know you guys are going to be doing conventions. Don't say anything. <laughs> You're only allowed to talk about the films that are already out. I have seen a little bit of it. It looks incredible. Hello, quick comment first. Um, being a huge book fan for many decades, I just wanted to say that your portrayal of Gimli is, from my book vision of the characters, the closest of the whole fellowship and everyone in the book. In yeah, that's a close second, but you are my Gimli from my book, and I just want to thank you for oh, making it so good. I agree. Um, well, you know, we dwarves do appreciate that sort of comment there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little known fact that you girls are just wild for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like Catherine, I mean, in yeah. the when John, John came to visit us on the set when we were shooting, and the first thing he said to the dwarves, he said, You are going to be chased by women all around the world! <laughs> of course, it's not absolutely correct, but by God, it got us excited. <laughs> you needed words of encouragement. <laughs> There's just that personality of the way dwarves view themselves and the world is there's something very sexy and masculine about that and I love it. <laughs> but my question actually I, I, I think I think I, I, let me, I can only really talk about Gimli because I, I didn't work with the guys on their, their show. But the great thing about Gimli is he's such a mixture of characters, isn't he? He's he's uh, uh, he's narrow, mean spirited. You know, uh, and at the same time, he's he's a great, open, generous, loyal friend. He is um, as brave as anyone, and yet terribly superstitious. And you know, he doesn't really like spooky things. You know, because you know, uh, and it, it's it's those it's the mixture and the contrast of the characters. And of course, the one thing that I decided about him. That would be the crucial thing is we need you know, Lord of the Rings is is so undramatic in its shape. You can't make a film of Lord of the Rings because things are okay and then something bad happens and then things get a little bit worse and something worse happens and then there's a little fight and then things get rather worse and then <laughs> So, you know, there's a bigger fight, and then there's a skirmish, and then something really bad happens, and then there's a walking. <laughs> you, you can't get the arc of, of, of change and difference and variety in that sort of thing. So, uh, Peter and I decided that the lightning rod for all this tension would be Gimli. And the, the secret of Gimli is he doesn't realize he's small. And, 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 and that incongruity of this man who's completely self-confident, completely assured, you know, um, his, you know, as far as he's concerned, Lord of the Rings is about a dwarf's leading, uh, uh, leading hobbits uh, to get the ring back, you know. And, as it should be. <laughs> but it's, it's that incongruity. Uh, he's such a great character for that reason. But thank you anyway for your kind words. Thank you. Connections with your characters as yours. Oh gosh, yes. I mean, that's part of your job as an actor. You spend your whole time drawing personal connections to the character and also picking up on clues for us because it's 13 of us. They made us look all incredibly different. And therefore, but also because it's 13, I know in a film, it's not, the film's not going to be about Bitha. So my role to play Bitha 
is to find what clues I can about that character and then use those clues to help create the scene. Um, I wouldn't always be up front, but every time I came to the set, I thought, oh, we'd talk to Peter about this. I said, Peter, you know, Peter would say, what you do is try and think of things that nobody else would do. Try and bring something different every time. So that's what I brought to that character. Is, and that was my, my job, I saw my job, as to come up with things that, how would Biffa do, what would Biffa be doing at this moment? And of course, Biffa's nuts. <laughs> Doesn't even know he's there half the time. Is the dwarf that they actually didn't even want to bring on the quest. <laughs> they couldn't leave him at home. What are we going to do with Biffa? He's insane! <laughs> oh, he has to come out. <laughs> How embarrassing. But anyway, that is, that's your job, to draw connections and clues and put them into the wrong. And, and you found insanity came naturally. <laughs> and I did. I've got an axe in my head. <laughs> I think we get a little personal thing. I'm sorry. It got better. <laughs> My question is for the both of you, and it's uh, during the process of filming either The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, just what is your all-time favorite moment from the filming? <laughs> oh, the bloody barrel scene. <laughs> the barrel scene was insane. I don't know how much of you guys have seen production um, videos, but as John will know, the craft of the people that you're working with is incredible and every time you walk onto the set it's like the shoemaker and the elves we go into a different studio and overnight almost another huge huge beautiful beautiful set would have been created i'm losing the question now what's the question again oh vacancy all oh, the barrels so in the barrels we shot it on a real river but then we they took us to this massive studio that had been an old factory and they had built a river in the studio, run by two huge V8 engines, all with natural rocks that were not natural, they looked real. But then we got into these barrels and they whizzed us around like a ride, and we did it for about two weeks, and my god it was fun! <laughs> we got pretty banged up, I have to say, but to get to whiz round and round, we all say, this has got to be a ride. <laughs> so that was fun. Well, uh, I had some aquatic experiences as well, as I recall. I seem to remember a malicious little elf and I <laughs> getting into a canoe. <laughs> the canoe capsized. The malicious little elf claimed that it was the dwarf that had capsized. <laughs> I bit my lip and waited patiently while the elf and I believe one of the hobbits got into another canoe and guess what, the only other canoe, canoe that capsized had the hobbit and the elf. I think I rest my case. Please never trust an elf. We can't stand elves. They clean toilets and their salads. <laughs> so, Mr. John Reese Davies, we grew up watching you in Indiana Jones, and we just think you're awesome. What two things? What My mother that? used to say that, but thank you, guys. <laughs> Um, what was it like working with Steven Spielberg, and if, if you were willing, would you sing the song from right after Mary kisses you and raises the yeah. <laughs> The question was, if you're willing. Um, <laughs> Spielberg is another genius. When I worked with him, it was really like working with a young Mozart. I, I remember a moment when he he started bawling out some technician. This was an older man, he, uh, 
And you would think initially, gosh, this is a bit unkind, and you know, this old boy has been in the film industry for a long time, a lot longer than you, Mr. Spielberg. You know, and there you are. And the more you listen to the conversation, you realize that this guy had been doing it for 40 odd years and didn't know what he was doing, and Steven Spielberg had been doing it for 20 years and really did. He, is, he has an absolute mastery of, and a passion for actually running that camera, uh, much to the annoyance of the Operating Cameramen's Association. <laughs> um, Steven's a genius, uh, a great, great filmmaker, and effortlessly creative himself. Um, great fun, great, great experience, I can only I can tell you. And working with, you know, Harrison, who had just grown and grown better and better as an actor over the years, and is really a great star of our time. And beloved Karen Allen, um, who is, well, it's always a golden soul anyway, um, and who I love and adore. Paul Freeman. You know, that, the, the, the handsome French archaeologist, Beloch, or Beloch, or whatever they call him. <laughs> Wonderful. In fact, possibly the finest performance in that first, in that, in that first film. Dear little Ronnie, for, uh, Ronnie Lacey, you know, the, the nasty, mean, you know, Gestapo man with, with high, with, with the, the thing burning in his hand when he goes high. Ronnie was a lovely man. He, 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 he was, his career wasn't going very well in England, and he decided, that's it, there is no work, damn it, I'm going to become an agent. So he got all his friends together and said, listen, I'm going to become an agent, I'm going to represent you, and at least you're going to be getting one of us who will really go and work for you and get some work. So everyone left their agents and came to them. Ronnie Lacey's agency, and three months later, Ronnie got Raiders of the Lost Star. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he was a lovely man. He actually sadly died of cancer on the stomach about seven or eight years later. But we'd worked, we worked together one more time. Um, we did with Connery, actually. It was a piece of nonsense called Sword of the Valley, with Miles O'Keefe playing. It was basically Gawain and the Green Giant, completely misunderstood by the writer-producer, who had actually done the film, the same film, twice. <laughs> uh, didn't get the point that Gawain's strength and survival when he is because he's chased. Of course, our, 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 our Green Knight was anything other than chased. Uh, uh, yeah, our Gawain was very anything other than chased, you know, having sort of spent the night with him. Green wife's wife, really, um, which is uh, it just made complete nonsense of the whole point of the film. But Ronnie, uh, Ronnie was really delighted because he was seven years older than me, and he was playing my son, and that really <laughs> he had great tricks about him. Ronnie, he, we would go onto a plane, uh, and he would mount up. He would mount the stairs, and he would get up to the top, and I was down there, or something, and he'd go, get up to the top, and he'd go... <laughs> and I would go around and look, and go, um... <laughs> and I'd look, up at, I'd look up at him again, and then he'd be going... <laughs> His best one was, he... I had a huge amount of luggage, and uh, he said, John, I've got you a trolley. I said, Ronnie, that's extremely kind of your boy. He said, yes. <laughs> so I put all the baggage on the trolley, and as I push it, I realize that one, wee, one wheel has sort of bound up, you see, and I do a complete circle. <laughs> and I look at him and he goes, I'm sorry about that, but I mean, I, I just wanted to just fill you in about some of those characters who were, who really are remarkable actors, and were remarkable actors, and, um, 
and really helped to make that great film, a very great film. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you'll only get about two bars of this. <laughs> British tar is a soaring soul, as free as a mountain bird. His energetic fist should be ready to resist a dictatorial word. <laughs> I never could sing with you. video diaries. So when you walk at Alpha Set, there's cameras in your face. There's cameras everywhere all the time. But Martin took great delight and every time he saw a production video diary, he'd go. <laughs> <laughs> every, every single time as he walked up. <laughs> because he knew that they wouldn't be able to use it. <laughs> Now uh, the other one, Aiden, Aiden, we were um, going up to battle. It's in the next film, can't really talk about it. But we, you know there's a battle. It's called the Battle of Five Armies. It's a battle. So we're getting ready to do the battle, and we're all grabbing bits and pieces. And when you're an actor in a scene like that, as John will well know, you, you do your own, but you work out your own business, especially with Peter, because that's part of your job. So you preset things. I'm going to grab this knife, I'm going to grab this sword, I'm going to get the helmet. And you put those things in a certain place, so you grab them, grab them, walk out past the camera looking like a hero. Aiden Turner started hiding my stuff <laughs> during the shot. So, Peter Jackson says, and action! And you go to the place to get the thing, and there's nothing there. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do? Grab something completely stupid. <laughs> I got him back though, I've got his underpants. Let's have a story. <laughs> I keep telling him, he keeps forgetting. One day I'm gonna auction Aiden Turner's underpants for charity. <laughs> when he's really famous. sad things about our age is that there's been a loss of innocence um, and it's heartbreaking for, for, for our friends and allies who are, who, who are Arabs um, because of what has happened over the last 20 years uh, I'm not sure that a character like Salah can play he's not you know he's Salah is a loyal, trusty friend, uh, and now we're wondering whether, in fact, under that fez there was a, you know, the, the, there was a suicide bomb or something like that. Um, it's uh, the, the Arabs are an extraordinary people, and and they they have an extraordinary culture, and, and yet. They're so insecure in so many ways. And um, I better not talk anymore about this, because it's getting politically sort of dangerous. But the, um, 
You would hope that through film, we could start building bridges and relationships. But that is getting harder and harder to do. And uh, I wish I knew what the answer was. Um, I personally love playing Arabs. Um, every time I go to Israel, they look at me suspiciously and say, you're Arab, aren't you? And I say, yes. <laughs> and every time I go to Egypt, they say, are you Jewish? <laughs> Israeli? And I say, yes. <laughs> All oh, right. Oh, I knew Lebanon. Well, he did work. When I was a little boy, I was about, around about five or six, I visited Lebanon. And it was the most wonderful country, really. It, you know, it, it was... Really, religion didn't come into it at all. It was all to do with business, you know. Could I do business with you? Yes, splendid in that case. Come to dinner and we will sit and talk and all that sort of thing. It was a golden paradise. And, um, it, you know, it was really sad to read uh, that wonderful book by P.J. O'Rourke, Holidays in Hell, um, you know, which is largely about the Lebanon and places like that. It's tragic. Uh, you know, how the heck have we got in the 21st century? We are, a barbarism is, is, is born and new every day. I, I, I do not say anything. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Favorite part of, sorry, say it again. Uh, your favorite part of playing the characters you play. Part of playing characters. Yes, like your favorite uh, part of the characters. Well, the opportunity for me was because I had the axe in my head. We talked about right at the start. The thing, wonderful thing about working with Peter <clears throat> is that you can offer as an actor. He is relaxed, confident director. Some directors aren't as relaxed and confident. But that means that you can say, if your timing is right, because that's part of your job as an actor as well, you can say, hey Peter, what if I tried this? You can bring ideas to the table, and he's open to that. Now, as a director, if that idea is not right, then he'll say, no, I don't know about that. But he'll say, oh, well, let's give it a try. And so right from the start, we were given the opportunity to actually put some ideas into how our character might develop and grow through the story. And so for Biffa, we decided that Biffa would speak ancient Dwarvish. And it is a, an incredible honor to be a person that carries a mantle of being able to speak a language that is created for you by somebody across the other side of the world. And there are days, I know that I don't say heck of a lot, but I did when we were shooting. And there were days when I would uh, say, I'd like to try and say this line. And they would actually contact the guy in America, David, I think his name is, and he would write that line for me in Dwarvish. So that was a very special thing for me, to be able to, to carry that thing of having a, a language created, kind of for my character. I mean, we all use it a bit, but it's kind of Biffa's thing, you know? <laughs> Did I answer that question? What was the question? <laughs> what is your favorite part about playing the character that you played? Uh, well, um, actually, just there weren't that many pluses, to be honest with you. It was a very lonely experience because AI was the tallest member of the fellowship, which which meant for me to get down and give other people my highlights was almost impossible in the costume, so my, my double frequently gave a lot of eye lines for, for other people. Um, and I would tend to be there at the end of the day, and you know, I sat around since three o'clock in the morning, and, and then I'd say, look, come on, you bugger off, you, you guys have done your day. And uh, so often the prompt lady would just read the lines for me, and, and then any close-up stuff, I, I, I would do that. 
Um, it was a very tough, uh, one of the toughest uh, assignments that I've ever had as, a, as an actor. It was worth doing because you knew that what you were doing was actually making something quite extraordinary. And, uh, and let me endorse what, what, uh, what, what my fellow dwarf here was saying about Peter Jackson. You know. We would shoot what was in the script until he was satisfied. And then he would say to me, all right, John, I'm cutting you loose now. Uh, improvise. And I would improvise. And when I heard him giggle slightly, I, I, I knew that it would be in the first cut at least. You know. um, he is a, he's a remarkable, he's a remarkable man in every sense. And I suppose, I suppose working with them and working with that bunch of wonderful actors because they really all are right for those parts. Was really the high spot. I just wish I'd been able to be there for them more often than I was. It's was just not physically possible because of the link up. Anyway, what I do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, behind the scenes, uh, videos for the hobby. I think it was in 87, there's this whole thing about how just the filming board just kept going off. 88. 88. <laughs> the infamous scene 88. We ran across the entire length and breadth of New Zealand, being chased by wires, with Ian McKellen going, Fly, you fools! Run, you fools! You fools! <laughs> Yes, I can go on. Sorry. Uh, I was just wondering if there's anything in particular you remember being, you know, if you remember about that scene that... I remember being constantly exhausted. <laughs> Look what John was saying. It is not easy to make films like this. It is not easy to make a dwarf. And I don't know what John thinks, but I've got the secret suspicion that Peter Jackson likes it when you really are completely exhausted. Because, as an actor, wearing the clothes that we had to wear, hot, wearing the prosthetics and running, was tough work. But uh, we would do it again and again and again because that's your job. And when Peter Jackson says, oh, we're going to shoot the scene now, let's run again, you just do it. And when he says, one more for luck, you do it. But, at first you're acting exhausted, <laughs> you know, at first you're, ah, 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 oh, oh, oh. but then, <laughs> Ten takes later, you're like, <laughs> and Peter goes, oh, that, that's a good one. <laughs> I think we've got that. He likes real pain. <laughs> so C88 was real pain. I was just wondering if there was anything in the Lord of the Rings that just seemed to just seem like it kept going on and on and on. Well, I... I... I can only uh, only say that my experience was being helicoptered halfway up a mountain and and sitting in my chair watching two people struggling up the hill with the costume in a hamper and two people struggling up the hill with the armor and then two people struggling up the hill also with a hamper with the axes and then somebody climbing up the hill with the helmet and somebody climbing up the hill with the boots and then they would put it on me and 80 pounds later Peter Jackson would say right John I want you to run up there <laughs> hey what's hilarious about that is the budget the budgets were slightly different because by the time they got to us we had 10 helicopters Ten, not two, not four, not five, ten on one day. So there was no struggling up with the hampers. <laughs> we had a bit more money. One of the great things was uh, we would fly in when we were doing that particular mountain sequence. And, um, and there was one actor, one Sean Bean, <laughs> who doesn't like helicopters. <laughs> So if we were scheduled to be shooting at 10 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, Sean would get me driven to the, to, to the last point of the road, and then he would be uphill and down there, walking all his way to the set. 
and we used to fly over him and go, hey! <laughs> We have just time for one more. I'm sorry to everybody else. Oh. That's a lot of pressure. You can, <laughs> you can always come and see us at the table and buy our autograph and ask us questions. If you haven't already. Yes. Um, I know you talked about this a little bit before, but um, in Tolkien's world, language is such a big part of it. Elvish, English, and Dwarvish. And I know I've watched the movies over and over, and I know each of you speak it a little bit. Um, what was your experience with that, and um, learning that, learning how to pronounce it, and having professionals help you? Uh, well, it was, uh, as I said earlier, you know, that was a great honor, but also absolutely hilarious, because you have got dialect people there all the time. We spent months before we even started filming, working with the dialect people, correcting you on how to say something that doesn't even exist. <laughs> Could you kind of do it right? Luma Fratta Ka! Oh no, you've got to go Ka! Oh so Luma Fratta Ka! So it was quite funny. <laughs> so you know, that's not right. But hold on, that doesn't even exist. <laughs> well it does actually, it does. Once it's written down, it's real. So that was hilarious. I only... I only had to do one, actually. There were probably have been more opportunities, but their experience with me on my linguistic abilities for Dwarvish was pretty limited. The only line that I could call was, Ish kakwi, I do So it went something like this. Uh, Ish What is it? Okay, okay. Ash what is it? Ash <laughs> Oh, I, I've got it, I've got it! <laughs> and they would stand around, just my fellow actors would stand around, in, starting off with giggles, <laughs> and then continual pain, because they all knew how to say the line, and I would be stunning. Ash Kukwa, Ex Proqui, Ow! My apologies to the children in the audience and their parents, I Thank you. You're welcome. Just about a minute left. It's wow, let's just sit here in silence. <laughs> Looking at each other. <laughs> I've got one more thing to say. I'd like to thank John for one more thing. Because I was going to say this early, but I forgot. And I have never publicly thanked him privately. But John um, did the voice for Treebeard. And I remember that in the very first read-through we had the golden moment of having everybody together in the room and we first started reading the script and we came to the troll scene and the, there was actors filling in reading the trolls and I thought, hold on, I remember what John Rhys Davies did and he played Gimli but he also got to play Treebeard and I thought I would love to try for one of those trolls so I asked Peter and I said, is it Cassian? He said no and I said, I would really like it if you could set up an audition for me to have a go at the trolls. And so they did. They set up an audition. I had to go through the whole process properly. And I ended up playing Tom. So thank you, John. You've been wonderful. Thank you very much. You're very kind and very intelligent and very smart. And I have a theory about that. Audiences. Uh, are different for different films, and uh, I believe that the Lord of the Rings and probably the Hobbit audience are the smartest audience in the world. Why? Because most of you have read that darn big book before you read it. <laughs> and those who, who haven't read that book before, read it after that. And it acts as a sort of sieve, you know, if you can get through that darn big book, <laughs> you're pretty smart. And, 
And the evidence for that is here today, and I thank you so much for that.